Hello, welcome to Mental Health Discovery and Recovery. And today I have a great guest. You know, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I used to be in show business. So I have Kevin Cassidy with us and he's in a branch of show business um, that that I admire so much. He was a stunt man uh, and his name's Kevin Cassidy. He wrote a book called Falling Down to Find Myself. He has a, a company now that that helps people, but I just want to give you just want to give you how his transition went and some of the movies that he's been in. They're they're pretty impressive. Uh, uh, Black Panther, Spider Man, uh, Guardian of the Galaxy. Wow, that's pretty good. Captain America, Civil War, Salt, The Hunger Games, Mockingjay, The Dark Knight, and many others. Kevin, welcome, welcome, welcome to Mental Health Discovery and Recovery. Yeah, thank you for having me. And so people wonder why a stuntman and a former songwriter therapist would be talking. So you have a part of your story where you were bullied when you were younger. And I love it when someone who was bullied becomes a stuntman, because as a therapist, I know there's a little bit of adrenaline junkie in all of us that enter show business because the risk factors, you know, I was just a singer songwriter, but still, you know, it, there's a risk factor. There's like a 98% failure rate in show business, right? So, yeah, and there's no guaranteed paycheck. No, and if you can hang on long enough, I mean, talk about freelancing. I'm like, wow, I don't know how free that is. It's a little <laughs> it's anxiety producing. But talk about some of, because it's discovery and recovery. So talk a little bit about your childhood bullying and how that kind of morphed into you becoming a stuntman. I would love to hear that story and our audience would too. Yeah, I, I was born with a uh, with a severe cleft palate, and um, I had pretty much from here to here was a bubble all the way back. There was no nose, no roof of wow. my mouth, no teeth, no nothing. So I couldn't breathe, I couldn't breastfeed, I couldn't I couldn't eat. I was fed by eyedropper for mm. first year of my life, and um, surgeries, a lot of surgeries, and then that resulted into a speech impediment that I still kind of battle and and try to uh, get better at. But throughout my life, I had different surgeries, different things in my mouth to hold my the roof of my mouth or a fake roof of my mouth. And um, seventh grade, I they took bone out of my hip to make the roof of my mouth and the nose right here. And wow. so it's very transitional. So, I mean, mm -hmm. with that and being uh, uh, an adolescent, you get bullied and teased. And Yes. Oh, and yes. It, <laughs> I mean, you get bullied and teased. And I, I don't think anyone is safe from it, uh, but, you know, you have different levels of it. That was pretty much the... Uh, I, I I tell people I'm kind of glad I had to wear it on my sleeve or my face, as it were, because mm -hmm. I couldn't run from it. You had you had to attack it. You had to deal with it every day. It was there, and I couldn't see my face. So I I forgot that I looked different. I don't know. I was just a a dumb kid or just short memory or didn't care that much. I just I would forget, and I didn't hear myself talk the way other people heard my, me talk. So mm -hmm. I forget that I talked funny too. But you'd always have the reminders and the teasing and then the escalates. And yes. that was kind of my 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 path, you know, through my adolescence. And I was always a good athlete. So I think there's a big correlation of like creativity and athletics. Um wow, physical yes. outlets were, were were big for me. I would do I played football, but I also wrote. I, I mean I wrote poetry. I was a big tough guy who at home I would write stuff down for wow. for release and, and then I would, you know, get in a fight and then play football. And then it was a whole lot of um uh it was all very upfront i had to deal with it i had to figure it out and, and move on because i wanted to be happy and uh i think a lot of people have different problems who maybe a little more under the surface and maybe even harder you have problems at home or maybe a learning disability or something that really kind of you can hide and i think it, it's better for me that i had to just face it and i think i learned a lot from that that's beautiful and literally face it just you know <laughs> briefly i i we were talking earlier but a, a kid one day at school said to me it looks like a camel crawled up your nose and died because i had a, a saddle bridge because i had broken it as a as a child and i and i remember i said well i'm just gonna have to rely on my brains because you know you know there wasn't like plastic surgery for kids they didn't have that stuff back then yeah. they didn't do yeah. those things so I want to touch on a subject here about that. We're going to address somebody out there who may be listening, who either was bullied or is being bullied, because I have a lot of young people that I work with. Um, resilience is what it sounds like you have, and you had some other outlets. How would you address 
the kid or the grown up who still is hanging on to that and can't do what you and I are doing is like, we, we're not laughing at it, but we're kind of laughing with it. Literally, you have to face it because it's on your face. You don't see your own face. I love what you said about that. Mm -hmm. People who get bullied, they don't see their face. They don't see their clothes. They don't see their, they don't hear their voice. It's different. How would you address a kid or somebody to develop resilience that they don't have it and can't, you know, jump out of airplanes and stuff like you do? How would you address somebody about resilience and and getting up like the title of your book, Falling Down to Find Myself? It's Kevin Cassidy. How would you tell somebody that it's okay to fall down and, and to gain resilience? Because you're either born with it or you have to learn it. So how would you talk to somebody who's going through this? It's definitely a little nature nurture. I think I was very lucky that nature blessed me with just a... Uh, I don't give a crap attitude from day one. I was pretty stubborn. Okay. And so I was blessed for that. Um, but I think a lot of people who who are in that are at the end of the day, it's, it's insecurities and your ego. Um, if I'm insecure about my face and or my speech impediment or anything, then a lot of times I'll retract back into, into ego, egotistical about it. Or you're always kind of battling against yourself until you can learn to accept it learn to navigate your world, learn to laugh about it as much as you can. When I was, my nickname was Rat Boy in, in junior high. I went to a pretty tough junior high. And I learned to answer to it. And it, it ended up being a, kind of a term of endearment a little bit. But at first it wasn't. And look, I'm not going to let that bother me. Move on. And then some of them didn't know my real name. They called me Rat Boy. Look, I'm sorry. I don't know your name. I don't worry about it. Everyone's doing it. It's fine. So getting to that point at a young age was really crucial to me. And I think the big... Again, I said earlier that I had to face it, so I couldn't hide from it. So that that helped me a lot. But I think words of wisdom is if you keep looking externally for approval for uh, how you treat me makes me feel good, then it, it's a never-ending loop that you're never going to be fulfilled. It's a, wow. it's a void you're never going to get to. So you have to look internally and focus on you know, what kind of person you are, what kind of character you have, what you know, you're honest, you're a good friend, and even the most bullied, deformed kids, they can get a good friend group and build confidence in, in internal factors of themselves that helps them deal with the external. The more you look at the external factors for approval, the more you're just, you know, you're setting yourself up for failure. So true. That external validation right. is highly overrated because it's never going to be consistent. And, you know, therapists call it self-actualization, which I just call it just what you said. I love that you said to accept it, to navigate it, and to and to socialize to be with people who are supportive so i hope somebody get the accept navigate socialize we're going to just boil it down I, I love to boil down stuff to bullet <laughs> points so now everybody's going to ask the question they want to know because like my first job out of college i worked for kiss and i told everyone i was a stagehand i fell into it how did you become a stunt man because this is not something you just say i can be a stunt man and you go out and do it uh, I, I mean i fell into it as well uh, and Literally my mother, fall into it. <laughs> <laughs> my mother was very protective of me because I, you know, I had so many surgeries growing up, and then she had to hold me with kid gloves. And uh, oh, he's not going to be very tough. And then years later, I'm a stunt man, a football player. We're like, well, I guess he was. He was going to be. Um, but I uh, I played minor league baseball, so I was athletic. Went to college and played baseball, mm -hmm. and I played in a very low level minor league. And then I was a teacher in Baltimore City and then uh, Washington D.C. outside D.C. Mm -hmm. So my passion has always been teaching, mentoring, all that. And, uh, we would watch a sport called slam ball on TV. It was full contact basketball and trampolines. It was crazy. It was on like 1 o'clock in the morning. I was 22 years old, and we would have a beer and watch this crazy sport. The next year, they had a tryout for this sport. So me and a couple of buddies drove from Baltimore to Philly, just on the goof to go to this tryout, and I, I made it. And <laughs> they right. shipped me to L.A. for the next level of the tryout, and I was a teacher in, uh, outside D.C. at this time, and I told my principal, hey, listen, here's what's going on. I got a free trip to L.A. for a couple of weeks. I can probably get cut tomorrow. I'll be right home to work. If, worst case, I make it, I'm there for like four months, I'll miss the rest of the school year. I'm not going to burn this bridge. You know, and, uh, and she was awesome. She's, you're young. Go to L. Are you kidding me? Go. You always have a job here. Don't worry about it. Go. So I went to L.A., and sure enough, I made the, the freaking league of the slam ball sport, and Wow. Uh, I was in LA for you know four months and a couple of guys I met in that were stunt people and relationship building and went back to Baltimore didn't want to go back to teaching again because I didn't want to leave my kids so slam ball was gonna 
Tom in the next month or two months and it never came back. It was uh, oh, it was in court about who owned the rights to it. And it was always like a long leash. And they they never told me we're done. And they were like, hey, be available, stay in shape, we're coming back. So I ended up going out to LA and living on a couch with my buddy who plays slam ball with me. And uh, he goes, hey, if you can just substitute teach, teach out here, personal train, bartend, all the nine odd jobs I had, do that out here. And the slam ball comes back to here. If not, figure it out. No, that's fair. I got a free couch in LA, let's go. So I went and he was involved in stunts and movie movie uh, sports in, in particular. He did the movie The Replacement. He was a quarterback at Clemson back in the day, my age, so mm-hmm. old like me. That's a football <laughs> and, school. <laughs> that's right. Sure. Yeah. And uh, so he had done these football movies and had a connection to football movies. There's another tryout for a football movie called The Longest Yard. Adam Sandler, Burt Reynolds, and Michael Irvin, and all these great actors and athletes went to that tryout. And, great, uh, movie. great movie great movie remake. yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> yeah it's a remake that's right yeah and i uh, made that movie got my sad card made a lot of money wow and um i was like hey, i'll stay in la and ride this wave as long as it takes and i'll go back and get a real job whenever i whatever this you know runs its course 18 years later i'm looking for an escape out of it because now i have a family and uh, so I just retired from that a couple of years ago. So that's a short version. <laughs> well, and yes, and, and, and I love it that you say escape out of it because, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm definitely not young anymore. And it's, it, there, there is, we used to call it riding the economic surf of the, <laughs> the occupation. We said there's, there's 100 jobs for 1 million qualified applicants. So yeah. And you probably took quite a beating through the years. Did you have any great terrible wounds or things you had to heal from that's a tough job tell it people is. about that tell people uh, uh, <laughs> tell people a, like a favorite moment you have from doing that or or a least favorite moment or you can combine uh, those uh, well there's a it's a, it's a most of my favorite moments of me failing so they're funnier stories so i was doing the movie the dark knight rises uh with, and um there's a scene where the bad guy t- um Tom, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bane in the movie. He blows up the whole football field. So we're in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they built uh, on the actual Steelers field doing this scene with all a bunch of the Steeler players. And a real player, Heinz Ward, was a guy who was going to catch this ball and run it. And the scene is he runs it, and behind them, the field's blowing up. He doesn't realize it's blowing up. Wow. And he scores a touchdown. He turns around, and everyone's blowing up behind him. And that's kind of the scene. It's a big, you know, $200,000 take with pyrotechnics and explosions. And they had built the field level up about four feet and put holes in the field. So all the stunt guys chasing them have to dive into these holes or fall into these holes um, to get out of the shot as he's running. And they're just it's solid, like, concrete wood it's not you no know, they're pads in the bottom but it wasn't cgi i take it it, was it wasn't real cgi thing. it was a real thing <laughs> so hey kevin you were a football player you'll probably be the best guy he heinz ward's gonna fake you out and then you turn around and catch him and at the end right before he scores you get blown up and he never knows you're there and you have any problem yet i'm like i i can't catch him he's an nfl player <laughs> i'm not fast <laughs> enough he's okay good let's go so I did about four or five rehearsals of it. And every time I'm running as fast as I can, there's a hole like four feet wide and eight feet long. I got to just disappear. So I just jumped over it the first time. I can't just go full speed and fall straight down. Oh. And uh, like, uh, it was great. But that one guy, he, he was in the shot. So the next time I just dove into it, almost knocked myself out. Oh. And But my arm was still hanging up on top of the field. I can still see your arm. I put it back in. <laughs> and... Um, so we got it down. I told Heinz Ward, I said, hey, you can't run that fast. I'll give me a chance to try to catch you. And we, we did about five or 10 rehearsals on camera without the explosions. And I got it down where I was, was pretty good. All right, let's go. And then we start off and we're face to face. And then he faced me out and I turn around and I go back and catch him. But now we're doing the one take. We got one take with all the bombs going off. All right, really good. So we got one take of this. Do exactly what we did last time. Everyone good? Yeah, we're good. And I'm beat up. My shoulder's out of socket. I'm dizzy. I fell on this hole like eight times, just ragged. And um, you know, this is the last one. Finally, it's going to be over. And right when that first bomb goes off, his eyes go, Poo! and he's full speed gone. Right wow. when he ran by me, I'm like, I'm never catching him. He, he's no longer going wow. slow. He's like, <laughs> He went NFL 4-3 and... I turn around, I'm like, I gotta try. So I'm as fast as I can, as fast as I can. 
and he's already in the end zone. He's turning around, and I'm the only person in the shot still running to try and get to my hole, and I dive in the hole the last second, and my leg was hanging out and ruined the whole shot. And uh, the director goes, uh, what was that? I'm like, he took off, man. <laughs> I didn't catch them. Oh man, they had, and, did they have to retake it. Uh, no, they just erased me right they, away. I was going to say they, they can CGI you out. Yeah, they, they, out they, yeah. They, can, they, can get, they can erase you. Well, I'll tell you, um, I don't think people realize that being a stunt man, you you get it, it's kind of like I was a lighting and sound major in college, and we used to say, you know, you get one mistake doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, watts yeah. equals volts times amps, and don't mess it up. So <laughs> you you probably got hurt, and you realize you you stay extra careful. I don't think people realize that adrenaline junkies, just like extreme sports people, I love the psychology of them as a therapist. They almost always come from some kind of traumatic background because this is about discovery and recovery. They they face it, like you said, they accept it, and then they need that adrenaline to kind of pull them up out of that. You know, the, the moments, and, and I know you probably had them. I think everybody has them. We're going to speak to those people that have those little moments of self-pity and you just go, okay, I need some adrenaline. I need some dopamine. There's neuroscience to this stuff. The, these wingsuiters, not, I'm, I'm glad they didn't have those when I was young because I yeah. might've been stupid enough to try it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the extreme sports people are amazing, but they don't just jump off of mountains. They map them out. Just like you said, you rehearsed it four or five times. People just don't realize that you don't just jump into things. And that's with everything in therapy. We have something called systematic desensitization. You know, you work your way through something systematically. You don't just jump into it. So I love what you said about you used to teach. So you started out as this kid who was bullied then you had athletics, then you were creative and you taught, then you just happened to be on in LA at a, you know, you athletics just for fun. Cause I don't believe life is linear. I think it definitely crisscrosses and you have different streams of talent. Then you, you come back to teaching. You're back to teaching now. Could you tell the audience about what you've done with your experiences? Because you didn't just fall down to find yourself. You're helping other people find themselves. And it's through, um, correct me, the name of your company is Ninja. I know it's Ninja, but I want to get the whole name right. <laughs> it's uh, Ninja Nation. It's, Ninja uh, Nation. Ninja yeah, Nation. It's... So tell us how you evolved, because people have heard your story. I just condensed it very quickly. <laughs> but how did you evolve back into teaching? Because Ninja Nation is another form of teaching. And before you do that, what did you teach in school? What was your subject? Uh, uh, I was science. I did PE and then science in those, in those days, physical science and PE. In those okay. days, uh, like now, shortage of teachers. So you once you're in there, you kind of help. I helped with the IEP program, special ed, and I right. uh, did a lot, mostly math and PE. Okay. Science and so very, very good to know the reason I'm doing that because, you know, I'm a therapist, I'm making connections for, yeah. for you and for other people. You're not, you're not um, in here for therapy, but I'm trying to help <laughs> other people to see how the process of connectivity works with yourself to get connected with yourself. So here you are, your PE major. So this would, um, or you, you taught PE, this would automatically have told you how to keep a little safer than the average stuntman. <laughs> yeah. You knew a little more about anatomy than just the average guy that, and, and I'm sure most of them do, but, but that's, but you survived, but then you went back to teaching. Tell us about Ninja Nation and how you help people develop resilience and acceptance and navigate difficulty. What is Ninja Nation? Tell everybody about it. And, and then we're going to work on, you know, how to, it's Kevin, Kevin Cass. K E V I N C A S S dot com. You can connect with him on that, and he's going to tell you what he does right now with Ninja Nation. Yeah, so I was in the in the movies. I was uh, I was over in London and Prague for four months on Spider Man: Far From Home. I had a two year old and a six month old at home. I flew home one weekend for a birthday party and flew right back to Europe. And I was I, I it's not sustainable for a family life. I want to be present mm -hmm. with my kids and I had a good run. Let's work on the next chapter. So I didn't. Like blink an eye and I said, let's leave stunts. And a lot of COVID help because all the movies shut down with COVID. Yes. So sure. I had all the all these business plans and all these um avenues I wanted to, you know, pursue after my uh, Hollywood career. And I wanted to always open a uh, multi sport facility, whether it's football, baseball, basketball, swimming pool and all this. And yeah. the more I got into the nuts and bolts of the finance and the P and L's and I'm like, that's just too big. I'm not going to be able to, I'll, be, I'll just be running the big business. I won't have hands-on helping people. So I went through a lot of iterations of what I wanted to do. And because of my stunt background and interacting with a lot of 
extreme athletes, motocross guys, Red Bull skydivers, windsuit yeah. oh, guys, yeah. <laughs> Cirque du Soleil guys, um, and all these guys. I really love their attitude, their mentality, what they kind of brought to the table. Their community was awesome. And I'm like, I, I want to do something with that. Now, I didn't do that. I'm not specialized in that. I trained it and I worked out with these guys in LA, but I mean, I'm not a ninja warrior. I'm not a parkour guy. I'm not a motocross guy, but I love their community and, and what they stood for. So my business plan was to open a ninja warrior parkour studio. I was going to buy a building and all the investors and all this. And I was researching competition. And one company in Denver, Colorado, it's called Ninja Nation. I saw them online. I'm like, oh, they're doing it right. They're beautiful, big space. This is really cool. They got to figure it out. And uh, they were just starting to release franchises. So I went out to Denver and I met with the, the, the CEO. We were on the same page philosophically. He was leaving corporate America to do something better, give back, do some you know, mentorship stuff and exactly what I wanted to do. So I partnered with him and opened up one of his fran- – I'm the second ever franchise owner of a Ninja Nation. And there's one more opening oh, wow. in Austin. And there's like eight coming in, in Houston. So they're starting to, the brand starting to build. And I'm helping build that brand and – and uh, business wise, that's my ROI there was with my time, my family. If I opened up my own business, I would live in there 90 hours a week, live and die by it. And I'm not saying yes. Hollywood if I'm doing that. So I'm home with my family. I give my kids a ride to preschool in the morning and I have a manager. So I'm very, very hands on with it. But back to the, the question of what it is, um, it's a sport. So we, we, we say you can play, train or compete. You can come in and do a birthday party and just play on an awesome you know, 12,000 square foot Ninja Warrior facility. We have airbags, you can jump in. We have everything you see on the TV show. We have all that in the big, awesome space. Pads everywhere, safety, uh, staff members going around spotting people. Uh, You can come and just play on it. You can come and train. We have a development program, like a gymnastic studio, come in and level up and, you know, push yourself. And we have a competitive team that goes out to competitions and we had eight kids qualify for the world championships last year. Oh, great. So it's every level of, of kind of how you want to interact with it. And I like it because there's no college scholarships. No one's going pro. You're, you're facing the challenge just to beat the challenge and get the dopamine from that. I want to jump from here to here. I can't do it. I fail. I fail. I fail. Oh, man, I did it. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Do that 11,000 more times in this facility, and we'll help you facilitate that. And a lot of kids who are good at baseball or football or gymnastics, they're eight, nine, 10 years old, and they're getting hounded by, you go to college and join me and go to this D1 training facility. Right. They, they're trying to get monetized at such a young age. It kind of sucks the soul out of you know, competing mm-hmm. for the sake of competing. Right. And you're competing against yourself and yes. against the time, the clock and everything else. So it's, it's a perfect encapsulation of sport that I think this generation and this world needs right now of humility, failing over and over again, then winning, high-fiving your teammates and have other people who are just helping rising people up and everyone's clapping and it's a really cool vibe. So that, that's kind of what I Oh, that. thank you. That's like humility, civility and diplomacy and hard work. And I love something because I booked market and I said, I'm going to talk to him and you said it yourself. So thank you because I have a lot of clients, a lot of listeners, a lot of people with mental health issues compare themselves to other people and they compete with other people subconsciously, if not so consciously. And I always say that collaboration is what a sports team is. Collaboration is what a band is. You know, when I played music, collaboration is what it is when you're a stagehand and you're putting a show together, you know, the lighting person, the sound guy, they need to get along so they don't ruin it. You, you know, that from being a stunt man, you're working with actors, you're working with directors. It's collaborative. It's not competitive. I mean, it's a competitive business, but when you're actually on set or you're in a, on a team, you're competing with yourself. Talk about that aspect because comparing yourself to others is what makes people anxious and depressed quicker than anything. Social media is one of the worst offenders and nobody's going to put up their bad days up there. They put up the great meal they've had, the great trip they went on. I mean, some people do the negative stuff, but talk about why competing with yourself and collaborating with others is so important to mental, physical, and spiritual well-being. Describe that. I think in order to even get to the point where you're able to compete with yourself, you have to have a, 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 an aspect of humility about you. You have to look internally, not externally. Like we talked about earlier, all those other external factors, other people, other jobs, titles, everything. Those are you know the white whales you're never going to catch. And it's not, not going to fulfill you. So in order to truly just compete against yourself, 
you got to be humble about it's just you you have to all your narcissism ego have to get washed away and your humility have to have to rise to the top and it's hard to do that and if you force yourself to compete against yourself then that stuff just builds naturally just by you failing looking around like when a kid falls and then look around and see if mommy's looking and mommy's not like i guess i'm fine i keep walking but if mommy looks and goes oh my god oh now i'm hurt now i cry so that wow. even at a very young age you're looking for that and oh i failed you're looking, making fun of me is anyone doing that or i didn't do this obstacle or i didn't do so good in this one and you look around for validation or and then it's an ninja world everyone's like get back up come on do it again like well oh, i guess it wasn't a big deal okay cool i can, I can keep going so that community <laughs> make you know humbles you and makes you turn your blinders off to other people now you still have to I mean, if you're competitive, like, oh, that guy did something really good. Cool. How, hey, how'd you do that? I want to be like that. I want to be able to do that trick as well. I want to get to that jump. How'd you do that? But you can still look at other people sure. and try to compete as with inspiration them. instead as inspiration. of humiliation, right? Humility exactly and right. humiliation are totally separate. Yeah. If you're at peace with, you know, what I call in my book, who you are, not what you are, and you have that humble confidence and you're able to see the world in that light, as opposed to everyone's looking at me to either attack me, make fun of me or... You know, you have to do a lot of self work to build up to that and putting yourself in those positions to compete against yourself really fosters that kind of mentality. Oh, thank you. And, you know, when you're working with these kids, questions come up and unfold as I'm listening to you because you're you're a really great spokesperson for collaborative and self-competition it because you came out of bullying i'm sure that in ninja nation even in ninja nation you probably have a mission statement and the kids come in <laughs> but there's got to be a bully in there or a, or a kid that's a little cocky or something that who ne who needs not humiliation but humility how do you handle that as an adult now having been bullied as a child how do you have a point of compassion how do you deal with that kid because bullying right now is tough kids are committing suicide over being bullied and you are the exception to, to, you know, you, you rose above it. So how do you deal with the bully and the person who's been bullied? I think it was easier for me back then. Cause it, like you said about social media, I, when I got home, it was over and I can have a whole nine hours of not being bullied because I'm in my, in my house or I'm playing with my neighbors or mm -hmm. it's fine. But if you're on social media, that might never end. You can always log back in like, Oh, they're still making fun of me. So it, there's never a drop in that, which is right. crazy to try to deal with. I was just, if you have a kid doing that, just get them off social media. It's not going to, they can't help. Unless, I guess you can find support groups in that world too. I don't know much about it, but just on the surface, you're a bully kid and you're looking at Facebook and you're still getting bullied on Facebook. You've mm -hmm. never had that break, which is just crazy to me. I had that break. So I think it was easy. You for did. Me. And if there's a bully at Ninja Nation, a kid that comes or not maybe a bully, but the kid that's making fun of the other kids or trying to be, you know, the, the, the lead dog, yeah. the alpha dog. How do you deal with that? And that's kind of happened. And I deal with it the way I help me. A lot of those kids need humility. And a lot of times what helps them is putting them in a, piece, in a leadership position. Okay, you're in charge of this one now. You have to get these kids past this obstacle. You're the coach. You're the team leader. Okay, you, we have these race lanes and you got to pick who goes where and you got to help your team win this game. But let's go. So putting them in a leadership position usually helps. And that's a part of adolescence. Just probably evolutionary there's a reason why we're we're programmed to bully and to be resilient and to 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 do that so i think it's a necessary evil uh, in the world to push people to to learn to, to to learn the lines a little bit like you know but when i was getting bullied i learned what was funny what wasn't where my line was okay right. that's too far man i'm gonna fight you oh and they were learning the same thing right. everyone's kind of learning where, where the acceptable line is boundary yeah boundary out of bounds, and everything. Out of bounds. yeah <laughs> So that's, we have to figure that out. And I think teasing and mm -hmm. adolescence is where you figure that out. So you yeah. have to kind of let them try to solve their problems a little bit on their own. But if it gets too bad, you step in and you never humiliate, obviously. And what I get, the simplest thing that works for me is putting them in a leadership position. Okay, that's now you're your coach. And they like, oh, it's not about you anymore. It's taking yeah, them out it's of the about situation. A team. It's about your team. You have to get this team to win. And, I'm and if coach you the other don't, team. it's on you because yeah, leader, true the leadership team, is yeah. service, right? Wouldn't you say? Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but uh, true leadership is so I love it. You put the kid who's got some hubris in a situation where he has to be a leader, where it's all on him if everybody else fails. That's why I love the show Ted Lasso so much. Oh, I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's just 
you know, I, I just never seen a finer example of exactly what you're talking about of somebody who uses, um, you know, discipline with peppered with kindness and, and he's so self-deprecating and, and humble himself, but yet he's really strong and can lead a team. And like, if, if there's two people that don't like each other, he puts them at the same table at the sports banquet. I just yeah. love it. Makes them yeah. work it out and just leaves Absolutely. the table. Yeah. So, you know, even if no one's seen that show, I think they get the idea from what you said too. So, um, and, and talk about uh, what you love the most about what you do. What do you love the most? Of, because people would think, oh, you must miss, because people say that to me all the time. You must miss being a songwriter. You must miss the stage. And like, no, you know, I miss the collaboration and, and being with the creative people. I do miss that. That's why I'm, that's why I do podcasts. Cause it's a, it's a way to continue that and to help other people promote their own work. So falling down to find myself, tell how this book came about and how your business folds into it. So people can, can know about it, find you. And in finding you, they're going to find themselves. I, everybody needs to find themselves. So, so talk about the evolution of this book now. So when I was uh, leaving Hollywood, my tangible, I, I say, I always need a Buffalo to kill. I'm a, I'm an old soul. I need to have another, another challenge. You know, and I got high enough in the stunt world where I was at the highest I wanted to go. I didn't want to go to the next level, but that was politics and other things. And, and I had a family. So, okay, I'm going to leave this behind. I was killing this buffalo for 17 years, climbing the ladder in Hollywood, which is, uh, was awesome. And it gives you the dopamine. It gives you, you know, something to push against. And, yeah. and, and then I need, I need that, you know. And uh, so when I left Hollywood, I had, well, I have three daughters now. So that, that fulfills that, I guess. <laughs> I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. So I'm in a, All girls. I'm a, all girls. Yeah. Oh, wow. That, talk so, about humbling. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. Yeah, I can't get away from it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the tangible, I still need to make money, obviously. So the tangible business idea ended up being engineering. Hopefully that can make me some money. Uh, I'll really enjoy doing it. And I get residuals in the movies I did because of my mailbox money. Okay. So I had some, I have some money always coming in from that. So I have a little buffer to, you know, my wife works. So financially mm -hmm. I was able to take that risk and, you know, plus COVID hit. So I wouldn't work on my movies anyway. Oh my goodness. Yes. I was able to get the business off the ground with Ninja Nation and all that. And um, I didn't want to live in that business because I wanted to be with my kids and my family. Mm -hmm. So my plan was, well, I'm going to do speaking engagements. And I had a buddy, I had a buddy who was a Spider-Man stunt double for all the Tobey Maguire movies. And he's one of the best stunt guys ever. He's awesome. And he got hired by some motivational speaking company years ago to put the Spider-Man suit on, talk about stunts. This is my suit. This is what we do. Here's a yeah. bat flip. Okay, see you later and left. We can't pay like five to 10 grand a pop. I mean, what, didn't really have a message. It was like, hey, I'm Spider-Man stunt double. I have look a at me, time. look at me, yeah. And what? <laughs> and then he ended up not doing that much anymore because he was so busy being the real Spider-Man making all that money over there. Right. I said, man, that's, that's an option. I can use the stunt work to, to do that. So I started writing different like, uh, presentations, but I really wanted to be deeper than that. I wanted to go into mm -hmm. character development and like my mentorship, all that stuff. Yeah. And I used my story to parallel it. And as I was had all this material and all this stuff, all these presentations for high school kids, college kids, corporate people, other, I and mean, then it was always kind of so many avenues I could go with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in a couple of writing rooms learning how to get better as a writer. And someone said, why don't you just write the book, write the whole story and be done with it. Then you can pick and choose whatever you want for whatever you're going to. I'm like, okay, well, there's a buffalo I can kill. Great. Now I have a path. The business is up and running. Let's go kill this buffalo right in the book. So, and then use that to, you know, help the world. So with the business being the physical outlet and the uh, challenge yourself, now the book is out. And that's a mental aspect of you know who you are more than what you are. And I have a couple philosophical um, themes in there that run through the story of my life from, playing baseball, I got arrested in college and being a stuntman and being bullied. And it's a pretty fun, interesting, wild ride. And I weave these um, themes into the book you know, to help. So I'm actually working with a school system here to build a curriculum around it. So I'm going to give the book right. to the school. Uh, I think they're ordering 60 copies. They're going to do after school program a couple of days um, before I come. And then I come like two weeks later they have read the book, they'll have a workbook on it, and I come and speak and do a presentation with the kids and their parents and the other teachers in there. Right. So everyone can kind of get on the same page with 
with a lot of them same messages you're sharing. So that's kind of uh, the business. So you're, book, this isn't really a book. It's that. a test. It's kind of a testimony. Yeah, I call it a philosophical memoir, pretty much. Like, here's oh, my I life. love here's that. My, yeah. Here's, here's how I screwed up. Here's what I did right. Here's what I did wrong. Here's what I learned from mm -hmm. it. Here's how you can maybe build some resilience without going through the trauma. I mean, the faster yes. way to do it, go through the trauma, I guess, but that can definitely, the risk of war is not there. Yes, so and the bully is the yeah. tormentor, but sometimes your tormentor can actually be a mentor. And also, um, let's just go back in time in this situation because it huh. folds into about your book because you're teaching kids. Uh, we've, we've talked about addressing the bully, but how do you handle the kid? There's the alpha kid that you make a leader. What do you do with the Omega kid? How do you build them up a bit? Everyone's different. Every kid's so different. And I think like teachers, Individual. coaches, individuals, mm -hmm. any group think is terrible. I think treat everyone as an individual, get to know what they're good at, what they're not good at, what may, as a teacher or a coach or anyone you're interacting with, you can't treat everyone like a blanket. And so you have to know that kid or that person Yes. And uh, have a relationship with them and know what is going to help them, what's not going to hurt them. Before you get in there, I, I'm a very big, with my daughters, I'm tough love. You need to tough, but you need to love. I hug as much as I Aww. throw the iPad out the window. <laughs> yeah. So um, so that builds resilience, I think. So in, in that moment, if someone's getting bullied, you got to see how the other kids react. Are they, are they, are they lost? Are they crying? Is their head in the sand? And just there's no reason with them. They need a hug. Give them a hug. It's okay. Yeah. I'm here. Don't worry about it. Let them get to a space where they can talk about what happened. And then if they're not that far and they're just, maybe now they're getting mad, they want to punch a bully or something. Okay. Now you can hang it a different way. Remove them in the situation. Listen, I get it. He was wrong. He's being punished. We're going to work together. We're on the same team. Now what do you, and figure out what they need to build mm -hmm. their, to build their humility and their confidence up. And, you know, and a lot of times it's telling them, listen, this, I, one thing I've said a long time ago, I, I heard someone told me was everyone is a, the lead character in their own book and you're probably not in it. Uh, so That's realize hey, he's going through his own thing. He, he's trying to figure out, he's having some problems at home where you know, don't air mm -hmm. it out and don't tell him, but he's right. working through some things. And sometimes when people work through things, it's like, you're working through it now. You wanted to hit them. You're working through some things that you happen to you right now. He right. can be doing the same thing. So be, be patient with him. And again, now if it's uh, chronic, what happens every day, then we have to go on. But if it's an isolated incident, we try to build empathy for, for both sides of it. And then empathy. You know, build for there. The magic word, empathy. Yeah. Very different than sympathy. Sympathy, you feel sorry for people and you have pity and they huh. stay in the pit. But empathy helps them. I always say empathy helps people out. Sympathy sucks you in with them in the pit and that doesn't do any good. No, and for sure. um, you'll probably relate to it, but... I, I have had, especially particularly young people like you work with, blankly, I can say things, it's not any one person, mm -hmm. but people will get mad at me if I'm not over there crying, you know, if I'm not crying, hearing their story. And I always tell them, would you, how would you feel if I was a therapist and I come over on the couch and hold you and start crying with you and grabbing mm -hmm. tissue? I mm -hmm. said, I would hope you would find it really creepy and run. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said, you know, you, you're something's tormenting you and I'm here to be a mentor. So, yeah. you know, to, to individually and to teach them that someone else's opinion of them should not affect their opinion, but it does the external validation. But if there was any theme running through today, it would be, don't look for external validation. You will not find it consistently. Will you find it? Yes. Have you had applause? Have you had director's pat you on the back actors say you're great man of course you does it feel good yes it gives you dopamine adrenaline it, 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 oh it just feels so good but at the end of the day you're going to a hotel room in some country where you don't even speak the language and you're all alone going you know i used to ask i used to ask the guys on kiss that i said how do you go from eighty thousand people screaming at you validating you to these lonely hotel rooms i mean it is a shock to the system so uh, you know people never think about that part of show business where just might be just a bodyguard or an assistant or somebody working for them so i i love how you um i i love how you taught people that to to not look for external validation and do you have any um would you would you talk about mental health and your career and how you could help somebody out there talk to that talk to that kid that that is you was you or or doesn't understand again the concept of resilience and self-validation yeah and every 
every age is different. Everyone's got a different intellectual space, emotional space. You're talking to an mm -hmm. eight year old or 18 year old, and everyone's in a transition. So I think the, the common theme is you're always going to find a transition. Hey, two years from now, I, I tell some kids, man, what was your biggest problem two years ago? Yeah, is that a problem anymore? No, that's crazy. That's going to happen two years from now. So let, let's think a little bit bigger. But uh, even I say in my book, when you're young and you're just trying to survive day to day, you're only seeing in front of your nose. It's hard to be motivated by two years from now. But looking back, it's easier to see, oh, yeah, I, when I cared about the color of my pencil, I cried about, yeah, that's stupid. I didn't do that anymore. Okay, well, just put that in perspective here. That maybe we'll get here with this down the, down the road. Yes. So uh, that helps them you know, internalize a little more. Mm -hmm. And again, if you're dealing with an 18-year-old going from high school to college, you have to build up. You're going to go to a whole new world of shark-infested waters. There's going to be a bunch of beautiful islands, a bunch of shark-infested waters. and it's, you got to be really confident in who you are to navigate that world. So you know, let, let's, let's start building that as early as possible by doing the simple things like self, positive self-talk, getting, mm -hmm. my big thing was I always had good friends. Even though I was getting bullied, I had a core of good friends. I had teammates. Uh, me and my brother didn't get along. He picked on me too, but now we're great friends. But um, there are good people everywhere. Don't yes, there are. lock yourself up and for think 90% of the people are here to help you, 95%. Uh, the people who are the loudest and bullies, they're the minority. Go to the guy right next to him. Like, hey, that guy's yelling at me. Do you want to uh, go play chess or something? Yeah, sure. It's just they're they're there. So yes. Don't don't focus on the negative. Look at the bigger picture and find that community that that will will help you be be successful and build that up. And that's what I had from from day one. And some people oh, are right. intimidated by that too. But put yourself out there in that world. Oh, and yes. Never, and never stop. I love that. So I'm going to condense that. This So people need to quit. And, and no matter what age you are, whether it was in the past or whether you're dealing with it in the present, is find a community. I always call communities common unity. And don't focus on the negative people. Focus on the supportive people. Because if you focus on the negative people who are hurting you, uh, you won't find the supportive people. You'll spend way yeah. too much time. And and something else I, I bookmarked that you said, you said, I, I have, I believe in tough love. And you know, when, when you said, I'll, I hug them, but I'll throw away the <laughs> iPad. So what, what I tell kids who come in, can you imagine how many kids come in? I want my phone back. I want my iPad back. Usually I tell the parents, please give them their phone back with a lot of controls on it. So you know where your kid is, yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, it, it is a GPS tracker for your children. So yeah. there's some, but there's parental controls out the ears on those things. Yeah. On the same token, I tell kids all the time, your parents are not correcting you. It sounds like they're correcting. They're actually protecting you. So reframing things. So you've been teaching people all day in this conversation to reframe the bullying and to, you can use the bully for a mentor too. You really can the tormentor for a mentor. You truly can. Absolutely. You're a tormentor uh, can become your greatest mentor and mentors really aren't friends. Mentors, that is a tough love thing. The wax on wax off. Let's, you know, karate kid. So how can people become part of Ninja Nation before we go today and anything, any other um, uh, thing that's pressing on your heart or soul to talk about? Uh, so the Ninja Nation right now, there's two locations in Denver, Colorado, one in Dallas, Texas, one's being built in Austin, uh, a bunch are being built soon in Houston and Phoenix. Um, but if you can't find that my actual business, or I'm a franchise owner of the business, mm -hmm. then research Ninja Warrior gyms, parkour gyms. Like if you're, if you're a parent and you have a kid who needs a physical outlet or he's not really liking soccer, he's kind of bored with this. Gymnastics is just too cutthroat. I'm really having research ninja gym, throw them in there and see what see what see what sticks. It's a really good environment. Um, because there there there's a thousand of them out there. It's not only an insulation summer, uh, in the guy's garage or warehouse at CrossFit gym. Others are million dollar facilities like mine. Everything in between, but everyone's got a good community, and the sport in, in general is just pretty awesome. So well, if you I can't hope find ninja nation, yeah. If you haven't Ninja Nation, go, go to their website, go to my website, Ninja Nation, and see where they're coming up. And then if they're nowhere near you, just you know, look for a Ninja Warrior Parkour Gym near you. And it's, it's a pretty cool outlet for your kids. 
Well, thank you. And the the book is falling down to find myself. And I want people to hear something that Kevin said earlier today. He said way in the beginning of the conversation that he had a speech impediment. And then later in the conversation, he said, I love this, Kevin. You did speaking engagements. I want everyone to get a grip on this. That you're, I've always said your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. And your greatest weakness can be your greatest strength. Because if you didn't, like I had terrible stage fright, debilitating anxiety. And I said, if I can sing in front of people, I can do anything. And I did, I really, I started singing just to get over my social anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> and I threw myself into theater, which was, was it torture at first? Absolutely. But then it became a community because, you know, it's a collaborative art and, you know, being in films is a collaborative art. Songwriting is a collaborative art. It's a beautiful thing to be in a studio and, and see all the people. So I want people to get this beautiful message today from Kevin, that even if you fall down, you can fall up too. You know, you, you really can, you can learn and, um, uh, and conquer your fears and use them for fuel. We say fear is the greatest fuel there is if you, if you choose to turn it into fuel. There's fear aggression, which is the bully. And then there's the person who uses fear for fuel, which is the resilient one. So thank you for sharing your story. And it's again, falling down to find myself, Kevin Cassidy. His website is kevincass.com. It's on Greenleaf Publishing, I believe, is your publisher. Yep. Yep. Thank you so much. And if, if there's anything else you'd like to share, one final thought. Boil the conversation down. I like, I always like oh, guests to have the last word. What would you love <laughs> oh, to say to somebody? You just, I, I, you know, you know, come on, uh, improvise. You had to take an improvisation uh, class. Uh, I did, yes, and, yes, <laughs> and. <laughs> uh, um, do something hard. If it's not hard, you're not growing. If you're not challenging yourself, you're not, you're not, you're not finding humility. If you're, if you're in your safe space and you're just in your echo chamber or, or physically, emotionally, mentally aiming, you know, putting yourself out there, uh, like I'm being very vulnerable with my book, talking about my speech impediment, my my birth defect, and all the failures I had. I could just be like, "Hey, I was a Hollywood stuntman. I know all these famous actors, and I had a cool life." And that would just feels hollow to me. So me focusing on 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 being vulnerable, and other people, hey, it's okay to be vulnerable. Be vulnerable and do something hard. That's how you build humble confidence. Oh, great. So playing it safe might be the might be yeah. the unsafest <laughs> thing you can do. Thank yeah. you so much, Kevin, for sharing your story. And I really hope that people discovered how they can recover and use adversity and creativity. Like Kevin learned to write. You, you think an athlete's not a writer? Yeah. And you, you didn't hire a ghostwriter. You wrote it. <laughs> yay, yay for you. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing with us. And I really hope it helps a lot of people. And Get in touch with Ninja Nation. It sounds like a wonderful organization. Thank you, Kevin. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs>